Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So in continuation of our summer farm tour series today, we are once again getting the pleasure of hanging out with Jane Murner and her father, Mike Murner of Earth Care Farm in Rhode Island, where they produce a massive amount of compost on a pretty small area, as you saw in last week's video with them. This week, we are getting more of the history and the details of how this operation started from a forest to an organic Christmas tree farm in the 80s is interesting to what it is today. You get a tour of the farm and the history of how they scaled up, how they manage herbicide contamination and the materials that they bring in, and a whole lot more. If this or any of our videos are right up your alley and you'd like to support this work, consider picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com where we dive deep into no-till gardening practices or pick up a hat or other merch while you're there. Become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash no-till growers. It's because of you wonderful humans that have supported us that we are able to send my partner at notillgrowers.com, Jackson Roulette, up there to film some of the best farms in the country. So thank you. And if you ever have any questions related to this video or any of these videos, uh, head over to the forum at notillgrowers.com. Uh, that's the best place to get specific growing questions answered. The link is in the profile. Okay, enough from me. Enjoy one more video from Jane and Mike of Earth Care Farm. Hi, I'm Jane. And Mike. From Earth Care Farm. We're here in Charlestown, Rhode Island at our family's large scale compost farm. <laughs> we also grow lots of produce and we have bees and goats, but um, compost is our, our true love, what we love doing. And so we're gonna talk about how we got started and where we're at today. <laughs> well, it could take all night to talk about how we got started. <laughs> but in a nutshell, um, I studied agriculture at URI when they had a College of Agriculture. And um, back then it was the only option that you could study was chemical intensive agriculture. And so I experienced that for a very short term and witnessed the problem we were doing to soil life by using synthetic chemicals, the pesticides and chemical fertilizers and whatnot. So I sought out an alternative from my college education. I had to unlearn a lot of things and relearn. And it was Rodell Organic Gardening that was um, my main go-to, but I also studied biodynamics from uh, the Biodynamic Association and did different readings on organic gardening. And we converted the farm uh, from my past practices to an organic farm. We were in the first group of organic farms in Rhode Island. Back in uh, 1977. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's when we started the farm yeah. in 77. The, it didn't get organic until the 80s. Yep. I think, and, the, I think 1990 was the actual certification process. We were right. farm number one for that. Yes. <laughs> but now it's kind of evolved. Jane's taken it to a different level. We've gone from the traditional organic farming to more regenerative farming. No-till practices now. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, um, and that's even better for the soil and the soil life, which is, um, that's what it's all about, our foundation of soil health and well-being for uh, the planet. There's two components to reversing our problem with the climate crisis. And one is reducing our emissions, and that's not so easy, but it's, we can work at that. But the other, much more doable component to reverse our climate change is to, um, compost all our organic resources and sequester the carbon in the ground. For every 1% that you increase the organic matter in your soil, you're sequestering 10 tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. And uh, when we first bought this farm, it had one, approximately 1% 1 organic matter in the soil. And now when we have the tests done, the different fields have between 10 and 20 percent organic matter. And it didn't happen overnight, but it was just a, a slow process of every year applying some compost on the fields. And um, it really worked out. I, I could speak to saying that I then took over 40 years after Poppy, my dad, has been building up the soil so beautifully here with our own compost. and 
it is just a joy to work in a truly healthy soil. Um, it's, it's so easy and um, there's so much life in the soil, so much life on the, so many insects, so many birds, just so much life vibrating around us. Um, it's just a, a, I can't, I can't even express the words to say how, um, how enjoyable that is to work with. And then to continue to c constantly improve our composting f um, operation and meld the two so beautifully. Um, people don't think of a large scale operation as a beautiful operation, but I live right in the middle of it. Poppy and my, my mom live attached in, a, in a, the in-law apartment next to it, it, right in the middle of this large scale compost operation and farm. And it's a beautiful place to live and work. And I, I, I just, I'm thrilled that people get to watch this and hopefully we get to replicate this around the world, a yeah. little melding of models. Yeah, it's of a multi-generational farm right now. We have three generations working on the farm. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's kind of ideal. It's, it couldn't be better in my opinion, <laughs> in, the, in the physical realm. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, mm -hmm. uh, and you, no matter how aware you are, you can't be aware of all the life that's around you um, that you need to work in harmony with. Often people think of a, a farm like this and they think small scale and we're taking in uh, like a hundred tons of material a day some days and turning it into this beautiful high quality compost so you can meld both high quality large scale and beauty. Yeah, and it's, it's not just the organic materials from the farm that we compost not just the, the stalks and the leaves and the spent hay and bedding and manures we're taking resources from our the larger environment the local environment around here hmm. um, and we value them and uh, it's a win-win for everybody <laughs> when i bought this land it was all forest it was a, an abandoned farm uh, when farmers left to go to the, after the soils got a little depleted around here they left to go to the Midwest or uh, where there was better soil and uh, so I bought it it was an abandoned farm with all trees growing on it but it had the rock walls and our my first thing was to um, become a tree farm and I thinned out the, the, the forest and then we became a Christmas tree farm. An organic Christmas tree farm, <laughs> which was so funny in the 80s. <laughs> a lot of people thought, why do you want to bother with that? Because we don't eat the Christmas trees. So it was a matter of taking care of the soil and the earth. Yeah. But uh, so after we cleared out the trees, we became a Christmas tree farm. And the soil was really uh, poor, deficient, infertile, acidic. And, um, but by putting compost in the aisles between the rows of trees, when we, then when we harvested the trees, that's when we turned into a vegetable farm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember you planted clover between the Christmas trees too, in yeah, that composty uh, soil spread, spread that the, added to fertility. Had green manures, cover mm -hmm. crops in between the trees, and, um, and over the years, we've had every kind of farm animal. We had the sheep and chickens and pigs and cows. And it was in 1990 that you had the CSA here. Right. One of, I want probably one of the first CSAs in the country <laughs> back in 1990. Um, and uh, all sorts of people helping and volunteering yeah. with that. Yeah, it, it takes a village. It takes <laughs> many, many hands. We've had lots of help and lots of people attracted to doing this. I couldn't mention, I. The, not dozens, hundreds of people that have yeah. worked on the farm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's really been a community building place too. Right. <laughs> well, the compost operation grew slowly. Um, I needed to compost. I also had a landscaping business when Jane was a young, young child. So I was trying to put lawns in as a landscaper and realized I needed to make a lot of compost to have a a good quality seabed for the uh, lawns that were going to be maintained organically, not maintained with chemicals. Um, so I started making compost for my own landscaping business, and I started really small. I only had a landscape tractor with a one cubic yard bucket, and that's how we turned. We were a windrow system back then, and we turned with a uh, just a, a little uh, front end loader that was a tractor with a three point hitch. 
but the business grew. And that was when you were collecting materials. Yeah, I was collecting from 20 different riding stables, the horse manure and beddings. And, um, I can remember going down to the docks with you to get some fish scraps from, yeah. the, from the fishermen co-op. And, and you can remember going to the circus to get the yeah. elephant manure. At the bedding. end of the circus, we, we didn't <laughs> watch the circus, we just saw the poop at the end. <laughs> and like junior high dances, the Sadie Hawkins dance, we'd, he'd be like, get the, the hay bales and the corn stalks out of the, <laughs> at the end of the dance. <laughs> you develop an organic eye and you see the material everywhere. I would take stuff out of dumpsters and um, but back to the equipment we it grew real small we started with a small tractor a, a small dump truck when we went to the circus to get the circus manure we had to get the the strong man to push the trucks because we couldn't get it started <laughs> we, but eventually they organized <laughs> eventually um, what we required to do in the business came. We got a backhoe, uh, which had a bigger bucket and more power than our farm tractor. And then I got a little one and a half yard front end loader, used. Back then I would buy used equipment and build it up. And it, we went from a one and a half cubic yard loader to a three yard loader. And the difficulty was as the compost business grew, we only had one loader you needed a backup machine, um, and the backup machine would be the backhoe with like a one cubic yard bucket. However, when the payload was broken down, it made it for an awful lot of work with a smaller machine. <laughs> but eventually over the years, the, th the things um, uh, that were, was required to do it right came, and we got bigger and bigger payloaders, and now we have two nice five cubic yard payloaders. And, and the I, piles built with sides with the with the different equipment. So if you can only lift the you know your bucket up this high, that's how big our piles were. But then as yeah. you got the bigger and bigger loaders, our piles could get taller and yeah. taller. And uh, yeah, and uh, and we learned the art of how to do it with the equipment. And the the bottleneck was always screening. Um, I couldn't aff the farm couldn't afford a screener. At least I didn't think the farm could afford a screener. So we rented screeners, but that was kind of stressful um, because um, you had it for two weeks, a month, whatever it was, and every time it rained or something, it was difficult. So eventually we started buying screeners and we learned which was the better trommels. And then eventually Jane got this um, very efficient uh, a uh, star screener, a Comtech star screener, which is really takes a lot of stress out of the business because we can screen much more efficiently and now we own it instead of having to rent it with a short time frame. And now I have two payloaders with five yard buckets. I've got the nice screener, I've got the backhoe, and I've got all the equipment for loading and equipment for unloading, skid steer, yeah. the, the loading tractor. So it, it's come so far and I'm just so blessed to get to take it over after all those kinks have been worked out <laughs> well it's it's at another level and i'm blessed i'm totally relieved that somebody wants to do it uh, the earth needs so much more of this and so many more people doing it it's good teamwork um <laughs> so it's um i'm very thankful that jane's taken it over and she can build on it <laughs> so we're on a 27 acre farm uh, I would say about three acres is field production. There's about nine acres of pasture, and three of the acres are compost production, just, just the three acres. Um, it's really efficient space-wise. Uh, I wish I had more space, um, but in that space we take in, depending on the season, between 50 and 100 tons of material a day. Um, organic materials to compost yeah. and then we produce in the end all said and done about 6,000 cubic yards of compost a year that's after screening and all the things um, so it's a small footprint with a lot of material coming in and there's a lot of reduction in the, the volume uh, to, for, for Jane to produce five or six thousand yards of finished screen compost it probably took 20,000 at least 20,000 cubic yards of raw material. There's so much of it's water and air and yeah. so that gets all broken yeah. down. 
there's so many feedstocks coming in too, so many different types of feedstocks. Um, our carbon feedstocks are leaves and wood chips and coffee, coffee bean trimmings, this like this husk kind yeah. of thing and sawdust and um, our um, kind of more nitrogen rich feedstocks are fish scraps, which is kind of unique to Rhode Island, I think, and shellfish. It's amazing, and, and our process does take a year um, to go from the initial stage where we're first mixing things perfectly to the end. And yeah. uh, I we know it, we know it can be done faster, but there's something about not pushing it and letting it cure and age that um, seems that it's better for the life in the compost. Well, I think of ourselves as like microbial life farmers. We're we're not really. <laughs> Uh, really, right, right. I mean, we're not really, it's not really about getting organic material in and composted fast. It's about cultivating a lot of life so we can enliven soil. So yeah. it takes time to raise any kind of animal. And so this is our, this is our, these are our animals. It's our, our livestock. Yeah. They're just microscopic. Well, what's important for the people to know that are thinking about expanding and making more compost is that Jane does a what they call a fancy bioassay, just a, a seedling trial on every batch of our finished compost. Because when you're taking stuff in from the outside, we ask the landscapers and everybody if they're using herbicides. I'm talking about the persistent herbicides that we need to ban. <laughs> um, but we ask everybody, but it's out of people's control. They don't know. The people who mow, a cemetery or uh, roadsides and may bring us clippings. They don't know the people who sprayed. So you, you need to know your feedstock, ask a lot of questions, do your due diligence. I think and, that's the things that have good policies. So Yeah, good know. policies, but it's a lot of it's unknown out of your control. The fact that these things exist or uh, uh, can't, we can't keep on going business as usual. We have to ban these persistent herbicides because mm -hmm. it's a really makes for, we need to be composting more and more materials for the health of the earth and we're composting less because of these persistent herbicides. I think I've taken like a hard stance that I am not a waste handler, I'm not a waste, I, I, that's not, I don't process waste. I think of everything as coming in as a resource um, and it's I'm here to make a high quality compost. So if you can reframe yourself in that way, it's easier to make decisions about what feedstocks are going to come in. Um, and, and have really good policies. So we have a written form that says what we can and cannot accept. We check the material before it comes. We, we make sure that, you know, um, if, it needs, if we need some kind of analysis about that material, we have that. And then when it's dumped, we make sure there's no inorganic litter um, in that, in mixed in with that, that material. And then still, even after that, we have uh, a test that I've now started doing like four months into the process, even though it's a year long process. I used to wait till it was finished and then test um, for the persistent herbicides and things, but now I do it four months in just in case we did have something I could nip it in the bud sooner. Um, but yeah, just knowing your place that this is a gift for the community to get to bring stuff here, you're not just, people aren't just dumping on you. So don't, don't take it. <laughs> I, I could say a little bit, I, cause I didn't have to start this, so I don't have that, that you know, background, but I would say that the number one reason that the compost facilities are shut down is because of na neighbor complaints. So really getting to know your neighbors and reaching out to them pre preemptively um, and making them part of the process and excited about the process. Um, we have, we're just fortunate. You kind of intuitively knew to do that mm -hmm. just because he's very community minded. Um, the neighbors love love the farm. They, they feel like it's part of them. They can walk down and feed the goats and they get produce. Poppy delivers pumpkins in the tractor every fall. And we have a, we have a party coming up for the neighbors in two weeks. Um, just make them part of that process so that when there is, there's going to be a time when a truck is going too fast down the road or there's an odor wafting up the neighborhood. It's a little more understanding. You can talk about it yeah. rather than just go get that fine from the state. Um, so that would be my number one thing. Yeah, you, you learn by doing. And um, I would say for those starting, start small and um, uh, go to conferences, go to other facilities. Um, 
uh, do your homework before you start taking in materials. The, the trap is there's tipping fees involved and the, um, a good compost facility will try to make their money making a quality compost, not just on the tipping fees. I would, I would add to make it a beautiful place. Like really yeah. think about that. Like when, think about when you're gonna give a tour, you want it to inspire people. Yeah. And so I, I, I really appreciate that you kept beauty as part yeah. of the model here, because that does, it elevates everything and it brings about more respect and care when there's a, that. It just makes you feel better and yeah. everybody feel better. Yeah. yeah, To keep everything well maintained. And organized and um, that's just, it's, it's yeah. such a gift. I, I have yeah. other friends who are second generation or third generation coming into farms and you know, there's some farms that just have stuff everywhere, broken down equipment and things around, and that's an energy drain for that new generation yeah. coming in where yeah. you just did a really good job of keeping well, it clean and tidy and beautiful. It's not work when you love it, but, yeah. but it is kind of, uh, it, it takes a lot of energy. So it's, um, uh, sometimes you can love your work, but you might not uh, feel real happy about all the things you have to do all the time <laughs> there's a lot to do <laughs> i'm i and i watched you you know you yeah. had such a bare bones crew right. and you had to work long hours and it was back when there wasn't cell phones so we had to come in at the end of the day and return phone calls all evening it's so much easier for me yeah. i have a bigger team and cell phones and <laughs> right. um just more you know I, i'm a little more free you know yeah, that's yeah that's so, where it should be yeah there's always a bottleneck or a challenge. I think that's part of any business and any, at any moment. Um, for us, it's always either too much material coming in or too much material going out. So we can't either, we either can't keep up with demand or we have like leaf season where suddenly we have yeah. 200 tons of leaves coming in in a day and where do we put them all? Um, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a real smooth, regulated type of business. We could have a hurricane with all this climate change, we could have a hurricane. Well, the last time we had a severe hurricane here, I mean, you could have buried the farm in wood chips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there there were so many, so many trees down and the arborists and the towns and the utility companies chipped it up. And they, they would love to bring it all here, but we're throwing just so much we can handle. And then there's the times when there's like, you get, you get fish year round because the fishing industry is year round, but the leaf season isn't year round. <laughs> so yeah. there's a, a point in like August, September where we don't have enough carbon sometimes. So yeah. that's, that could be the bottleneck. Or if the screener is down, that's happened yeah. before. Yeah. Um, and it takes time to repair and you know, it's made in Austria. So the parts take time to come in. Mm -hmm. So um, that can back us up. Uh, equipment is always a challenge. Having two of everything is super helpful, <laughs> but it's hard to get to that point. <laughs> um, and labor, you know, having enough labor. We've been really, really fortunate yeah. to have, you, you know, a good team. We have very skilled operators and uh, good mechanics, um, and that's needed. You know, mm. you need people that um, enjoy their work and mm. feel appreciated. <laughs> that's, my, that's my goal, <laughs> to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Did you only buy the seed once? Mm -hmm. Really? So back in 1999, I bought 20 pounds of garlic seed from Fedco, the uh, German extra hardy. And uh, ever since then, I've been saving the most robust cloves and replanting them. And uh, this is half of our garlic field. We end up harvesting a little over a ton of garlic uh, in July and we cure it and uh, it's so cool. But it, every year it seems to get better and the bulbs get bigger and um, she there, plants the biggest and the best. Yeah, and it's a, just a beautiful thing. And we sell most of that ton is sold and um, most of it to some local restaurants. But we have a long waiting list of people that just want a pound or two for their home gardens or their, their families. There's probably 70 people on our waiting list for the garlic that we're going to harvest in July. It's really, really neat. Yeah, Jane's um, garlic experience just shows you the super abundance in nature. I mean, to start with 20 pounds and then have 20 years later a ton. And, but every year she's also sold to other gardeners seed stock 
So that, that 20 pounds has become, it's astronomical how much garlic that's become over the years, over her two decades doing it. And just to, to think about touching every clove for 20 years, you know, it's, it's, it's so part of me. It's more than 20 years. It's, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to do a little garlicky. I don't want to do the math. <laughs> um, but our, it's we have a again. I'm blessed here because the soil already started out so good for me. You know, even 20 years ago. But all I do now is each fall I top the beds with our raised bed mix, which is compost, peat moss, and minerals, and um, tuck the garlic in, cover it with straw, and that's it. We we don't even water here because Rhode Island gets pretty good moisture. Um, and it's, a, it's, you know, if I was to dig my hand into the soil, which I can do, it, it's really soft and uh, it's easy to pull those garlic bulbs out. Um, I've, I've had some farm hands that help with that, have worked at other farms and it's, they have to get, use a pitchfork to get their garlic out. And ours just boop, comes right out because it's a soft, lush, beautiful till. And it holds the moisture soil. also. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's this really simple fertility management here. So we have a very simple fertility management program. <laughs> um, we, I mean, we're, we have fields that field was at 12% organic matter. Um, we have 15% organic matter. We're, we're in the 10 to 15% organic matter range in all of our fields. And so at this point, it's really just, I don't know, it's like when you're in shape and you, you just have to do, a little, do your e easy kind of regimen to do that. So pretty much it's every fall, we add um, our raised bed mix, just top a couple inches on the beds. And we have permanent raised beds that we have here. Um, so that's really a simple thing. We just drive the tractor over. We have two people on each side of the tractor bucket, putting it on the bed. And, uh, and that's it, we don't till. So it's just a super simple thing. We're seeing, it, it's like, the easier it is, the more productive it's gotten too. I, and I was really surprised when we switched to no-till, that which was only seven years ago now. Right. Um, there's a lot less weed pressure um, and the, just the texture of the soil is just so lush. Yeah, and, and the life isn't being disturbed. Yeah. And most farms in New England and Rhode Island um, need the lime every year because we have acidic soils. But here with the, the compost has got a neutral pH. We haven't had the lime in 40 years. Well, it's because of the little bits of shell. It's that calcium yeah. that comes in with the shellfish that's breaking down. That's just pure lime. So we have beautiful. a, a new, yeah. neutral pH in our compost, so there's been no need to have any lime inputs. So it's very, it's like almost too simple, <laughs> but it works. It works for here. And we've also found the crops that are easy for us. So my main thing is making compost. So I've garlic works really well because it's planted at a time that's not busy for compost and we harvest at a time that's not busy for compost production. Same with rhubarb, that's our other big crop. Um, we just go with kind of what works with our lifestyle. Um, I love to do all the lettuce greens and things, but it was too intensive with our also our busy season. So we just, you know, do what works for your farm and your fertility and your lifestyle. <laughs> kind of always had a lot of faith in the parasite predator cycle mm. and let things naturally control themselves, but at, at times when there's an imbalance, um, uh, you may have to do something, but we've kind of, in our home garden where we might have a little problem with something, we kind of let it go and it, eventually it seeks out a balance with the parasites and predators that seem to kick in. And also just diving into it. I did, we have asparagus and last year I started to have asparagus, bean, asparagus beetle. And um, so I just delved in, what, how do we get control of that? And I read that there's nematodes that eat the larvae of the beetle. And so I just was like, well, there's lots of nematodes in our compost. So I did a little top dressing last spring and I found in like, it took about maybe two weeks. And then I noticed a huge decline in the beetle population. So I think you've taught me from an early age to just work in harmony with nature and there's always a balance in nature for that thing coming. Sometimes it doesn't come in the timeline you want. But I mean, at 10 years old, we had a huge fly problem here at oh, the farm God. when I was in like the 90s. When I first started taking yeah. fish. And, yeah. yeah. And um, unlike, he had all this advice on sprays and different things you could do, aerial overhead things. And he was like, you know what? We're all gonna build birdhouses. <laughs> and so we put up a tremendous amount of birdhouses one summer. And it took about a year. Yeah. And then the birds, like there's just a robust avian population here that, yeah. I mean, they take care of the, the, the flies. flies. Yeah. 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 
Um, so that's, it's, it's finding that balance and it's simple and, a joy, and joyful. You know, it's not a fight, you know. <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoyed seeing inside of their operation as much as I did. If so, I just squeaked. If so, like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Also, make sure to check out Jane's amazing podcast, The Composter. You can find it anywhere you find podcasts. And go to the notillgrowers.com forum if you have any technical or specific questions about anything farm related. You can always support more videos like this as well as the videos I make by going to notillgrowers.com and picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or a hat. Or just go to patreon.com slash notillgrowers and sign up. That support literally makes these videos possible. Or you can just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Super thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Jane Merner here from Earth Care Farm. I hope you enjoyed the tour. If you're interested in learning more about compost farms, check out our podcast, The Composter. We get to delve into compost sites around the world kind of thing. Or is that, and then like, then I have to say subscribe or hit here to subscribe. Is that true? <laughs> How about I just use that? I just recorded that. <laughs> right? No, yeah, that's good. Okay.